This is a lesson on electric force by point charges in a unit on electrostatics. Electric force by point charges is actually a very fundamental force in the lives of human beings. Uh, this force is responsible for all electrostatic effects and underlies most macroscopic forces. So one ideal example is friction. Uh, when we think about friction, we just think about two surfaces rubbing against one another, and those are two solid surfaces. But when we really uh, zoom in on a microscopic level, if we look at an atomic level, we can see that there would be ridges along those surfaces. And it's actually the electric field between the atoms and the electrons in those ridges that causes the friction. So it's a non-contact force in that situation, but we think of friction as a contact force. It doesn't happen until those two surfaces get close enough together in order to activate, which is also true for the normal force. You're maybe sitting in a chair or standing on the floor, I assume, right now. Um, the forces that hold the, the atoms and electrons in your uh, body or shoes repel and are repelled by the ones in the surface supporting you. So the normal force is an electrostatic force as well. We don't think about it that way. We think of them as contact forces, but at a microscopic atomic level, at that atomic level, they're non, they are non-contact. And um, they're, it's very common. This force is so fundamental in our lives. You can see then that it's extraordinarily strong compared to the gravitational force. If it weren't, we would keep falling through the floor. Gravity would be larger to overcome that repulsive force from the floor below us. So it's a very large force at those very small scales. Between two subatomic sub particles, it's far greater than the gravitational force. And we're going to look at a, si a situation with a proton and electron in a hydrogen atom. We know this force can either be attractive or repulsive depending on the point charge. We have positive or negative. Uh, the likes repel and the opposites attract. And it shares properties and characteristics of all other forces. So it's going to follow the second law when I sum forces up and set it equal to acceleration. And also, that means that if I have two charges, um, Charge one is repelled from charge two, so I might call this the force on one from two. And also, charge two is repelled by charge one. So this force follows Newton's third law. So when we think about forces, we can treat it as a vector and think of it in free body diagrams as we have with other forces. Again, it acts at a distance, it's a non-contact force, and this force is conservative. So when we get to energy and look at point charges with an electric field, with electric forces and work, we'll remember that this is a conservative force. In a previous lesson, we had looked at the force by an electric field is a vector equation where we t just take the charge and multiply by the electric field. And that's how we would find the electric force. We also looked at the electric field of a point charge. It's just kq over r squared. We put that in to find the magnitude. If we would like the direction, we think about we think about the direction a positive test charge would move in that field. Uh, so we can just combine those two equations. We take q times the electric field, right? Here's the electric field. We plug that into that equation there, and we get this equation. Uh, the magnitude, and notice that I'm writing this as a magnitude. Uh, the force is K, Q1, Q2. There's going to be two charges required in order to cause this force, and it's over R squared. I've written the vector equation down here, and remember this force goes radially in all directions. The electric field for a point charge is in the radial direction in all directions, so this force is radially in all directions, and it depends on the sign of those charges. Um, K is the electric constant. We have the magnitudes of the two charges in there. That's how I find the magnitude of the force. R is the distance between those two point charges. And we're going to assume, again, that those point charges have no dimension. So it's wherever they are. It's that point that they're located at. Uh, and the units of force is newtons. 
Uh, the direction, like I said, is radially along the line connecting the center of those two charges. So it will be along the radius here. Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So whatever, um, once you get that line established between two charges, right, um, we can go like this. Once you get that line established between those two charges, we can look at the direction of the force, whether it's um, in which direction. Uh, this force is repelling that force, so I would call this F on 2 from 1. Um, so it's repelling, and I will draw it that direction. Uh, the signs arise for, from the coordinate system. So notice I use the positive signs to determine the direction of the force. And now I can assign a coordinate system. And in this coordinate system, I can see that this force points in the positive x direction. You could have forces pointing in you know, the negative direction, as it would be uh, the force on 1 from 2, is in the negative direction. And so I get a negative sign on a force that's from both positive charges because of the coordinate system. Uh, draw the force on the object of re interest receiving that force. This is sort of a problem-solving strategy for me after years of watching students draw diagrams to try to help them solve problems is always draw those forces on the object. Notice when I drew these forces, F2 on 2 from 1 is being drawn on that force 2. It's a force on 2, so I draw it on 2. Students naturally want to just connect those two forces, but it doesn't, it's not clear which force that belongs to. Remember, this is a Newton's third law pair. So we really have to distinguish, are we looking at the forces on charge 2 or the forces on charge 1? Draw the force on the object receiving the force, not the object exerting the force. So like I mentioned, the example problem that I picked out for us is to look at the gravitational force and electric force on the proton and electron in the hydrogen atom. And so let's calculate the gravitational force between those two particles and also the electric force between those two particles. Uh, you may remember the gravitational force and the values that we're going to need in here is the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron. Uh, if you don't know those or remember those, uh, or have those off the top of your head. Uh, there's the mass of a proton, and also here's the mass of the electron uh, times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. So notice the masses on those, they're super small. Um, G is a universal gravitational constant. You can look that up in, in uh, any reference. Also, we're going to need the charge of those two particles. The charge of those two particles are equal, and that's the uh, basic electric charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And the radius between them in the hydrogen atom, the radius between the uh, n equals 1, just one electron in, in next to a proton is uh, 0.529 angstroms, which is 10 to the negative 10th meters. That will be the relevant info we need to plug in here. So I can plug that into the gravitational force, 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11th, uh, that's uh, g. Uh, the masses we have, uh, 1.672 times 10 to the negative 27th and multiply that by 9.1094 times 10 to the negative 31st and we're going to divide all of those numbers by uh, the radius here for gravitational which is the same for both of them 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10th quantity squared. Remember to square that um, radius in there. Sometimes students forget to put that square on there. There's a lot of things going on in that equation and sometimes you just forget to um, put the square in there. So remember to do that. And when you calculate this number, when you run that through your calculator, you get 3.63 and some numbers times 10 to the negative 47th Newtons, negative 47th. So it's not, uh, there's not a non-zero force there, but it is definitely very, 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 very small. 
uh, let's calculate the electric force. So the electric force equals um, K, which we know is 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. Uh, we're going to put um, Q1 times Q2 in there. So um, one charge is 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. And I'm going to just square that term because the two charges are equal to one another. I'm going to put that over the radius squared, so point. 5 to 9 times 10 to the negative 10th squared. Remember to square it. So when I run those numbers through my calculator, I get 5.14 times 10 to the 11th newtons. Look at the difference in those exponents. Okay, so you can see you're seeing at the atomic level when we get at distances within the atom, this force is 10 to the 11th right? That's um, more than a billion, more than a billion. Um, and so maybe we can look at it this way. Let's take the electric force and divide by the gravitational force. And this would be asking how many gravitational forces go into that one electric force. So I would go 5.14 times 10 to the 11th divided by the gravitational force, 3.63 times 10 to the negative 47th. And you may already be getting the feel here. We're going to have 11, the power of 11 minus a negative 47th. We're going to get, and this equals 1.415 times 10 to the 58th. It would take that many gravitational forces between these two particles to equal one electric force between these two particles. So again, this force is so great when we get at these distances. And when you think about the cosmos in regard to scales, so when we look at the forces operating on the different scales in the cosmos, some will dominate over others depending on the scale. So at a large level in the cosmos, when you look at um, uh, gravitational forces across the cosmos, at large distances, it'd be gravitation. At smaller distances, then you get to the electricity and the electrical and magnetic forces. We'll look at that in the next unit. And also, when you go smaller in the nucleus, you get to the protons and the protons in the nucleus and no longer does that electric force dominate but it will be the nuclear force at that scale so forces different forces dominate at different scales and I'm kind of bringing this up because at some point I'm going to talk about the grand unified theory and the grand unified theory postulates that all of those forces are can be umbrellaed under one theory but right now we're not sure how they relate to one another and uh, but we are aware that they do exist at different scales and some are stronger at different scales than others.